difficult text. It's just when the Lord changed me and redirected me and gave me just a little bit of time to study this out, I, I, I like a lot of preparation. But anyway, <laughs> pray for us. Amen. If you would, turn with in your Bible to Song of Solomon, chapter number 2. Song of Solomon, chapter number 2. And uh, Brother Randy said he was unfamiliar with that song this morning, uh, The Lily of the Valley. And I got to thinking about that this morning. And I said, most people probably don't even understand the imagery with the Lily of the Valley. And I said, I need to preach a message about that. So before I went back to my notes of what I've been preparing last night for tonight, I said, I'm going to look up some passages on the Lily of the Valley. And then I began to read Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse number 1. And before I could get to the Lily of the Valley, I had to cover the Rose of Sharon. Amen. And the Lord began to deal with me about that, and I took a little time to begin to do some research about roses on the internet and reading about it. And next thing I know, the Lord had me hooked like a fish on the reel, and I wasn't getting away from this passage. But the Rose of Sharon, Amen. Some of you, and that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful imagery. And you're going to understand it more so. A lot of the imagery in the Bible we hear and we're familiar with, we don't really understand why it is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so one of my responsibilities is to help you understand what the Word of God is saying. Uh, but anyway, let's stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word if we're able to. And yes, that is a beautiful song. And uh, I love Squire Parsons' song, amen. I'll reference it at the end of the service, but I love that song. In verse number 2 of Song of Solomon, verse number 1 says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. You may be seated. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with the Song of Solomon, let me say when you enter into the Song of Solomon, you need to make sure you have a sanctified mind. Amen. Because it does... Uh, communicate romantic love between a husband and a wife. And I want to say that on a purely human level, this book extols the human love between a man and a woman and the institution of marriage between a man and a woman. That's God's design. God loves it. He puts his stamp of approval on it. He, he sanctions this expression of love between a man and a woman and marriage. But on a spiritual level... The book is an allegory of Christ's own love for his bride, the church. There's the spiritual parallel that you can't lose sight of. This holy love affair is symbolized through the courtship, the love, the marriage, all the things you read about between the marriage of the king and the maiden he takes to be his wife. In fact, there's a longing in the heart for the maiden to be with her king, with her husband. And by the way, I want to just say, because I, you say, you're stretching this. Well, let me say, Jesus is the theme of the Bible. If you don't see Jesus on every page of the Bible, you're not looking at it accurately. Jesus said in John chapter number 5 that the Scriptures testify of him. And so you're not stretching things when you begin to point out. And by the way, I'm not going down a path nobody's been before. There's plenty of songs written about Jesus being the rose of Sharon. I don't know, by the way, of another book in the Bible that exalts and exemplifies the beauty of the Lord Jesus any greater than the Song of Solomon. If someone reads the Bible, though, and does not see Jesus in it, I promise you they've got the wrong interpretation. But with that understanding, I'm interested this week in the phrase, I am the Rose of Sharon. What a beautiful picture that is of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, someone might ask, are you sure that's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ? And I would say, yes, I am. Another might say, well, how can this be a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ when it is the woman who's comparing herself to the Rose of Sharon, not the king? That's what's going on here. Well, let me say, God uses many things to picture himself, whether it be a woman caring for her nursing child, right? Right? Or a hen covering his, or a hen covering her chicks, 
And I want you to understand, here's how it pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, listen, all the theologians understand this. This is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, how can it be a picture of Jesus when it's the woman who compares herself to the Rose of Sharon? Well, let me say, the woman is picturing herself as a beautiful gift, as a beautiful rose, a pursued rose, a fragrant rose given to the one she loves. Friend, that's Jesus. Jesus is the beautiful gift. He's the one who's freely given to the ones he loves. That's not you and me. Now, there are times when the maiden does picture the the church, absolutely. But in this context, Jesus is the beautiful gift freely given to the ones he dearly loves. He's the gift, right? Not us. Well, from what we know about this rose that was found in the Sharon Valley, the Sharon Valley is north of the city of Joppa on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It was a highly sought-after flower. The roses in the Sharon Valley were known for their beauty, their soothing aroma, and pain-relieving qualities. What a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's talk about those three things that it was known for. And by the way, you can Google and find out these things for yourself. I'm going to preach them, though. The beauty of the rose... The beauty of the rose. Why is Jesus a pic- is he pictured by a beautiful rose? Let me say, first of all, the rose is considered, and I Googled this, and it came up, the rose is considered the king of the flowers. It is the king of the flowers. It stands out from all other flowers. What a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the beauty of all other flowers is always compared to the beauty of a rose. The rose sets the standard of beauty. Let me say, daisies are cute, daffodils are pretty, but the rose is the most beautiful of flowers. And let me say, that's Jesus. He is the king of kings. He stands above all others. He's in a class by himself. Let me say it this way. He is the fairest of 10,000. He is altogether lovely. And it's before his splendor and the beauty of his glory that we will all fall and say, worthy, worthy, worthy. Revelation 5, 11, and be- I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, listen, there's one who stands out in the crowd, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And I want to say in that day, we will bask in his beauty and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea And all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. Let me say, when we fast forward to the book of Revelation in chapter number five, we see him in his beauty. But I want to say he was not always recognized in his beauty. And neither is a rose in its beginning. A rose in its beginning doesn't start out with this beautiful bloom. To be such a beautiful flower, it comes from the driest root stem. And it comes from the ugliest stem in the entire flower kingdom. Now, I added that myself. It's an unattractive flower stem, but uh, it's a very ugly stem if you've ever looked at a rose. A rose bush has a dry, prickly, or it comes from dry, prickly little branches. And it would be easy to conclude that nothing beautiful could come out of dry, prickly, ugly branches such as the one a rose comes from. But don't judge a rose by its humble beginnings. Don't make your judgments based on its initial root system that it comes from. Wait till you see it bloom. Wait till you see what it springs forth to become. Don't judge it by the unattractive thorny stem. And as I began to think about that, and I was reading about how before the rose blooms, listen, you might think it's an ugly bush. You might think there's just nothing but dry stems and ugly stems. But listen, that's a picture of Christ at his first coming. Isaiah 53 and verse number 2, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, growing up before his father as And as a root out of dry ground, nothing attractive about a root, by the way, 
He hath no form nor comeliness, and we, we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire. Let me say, don't cast judgment upon the rose in its beginning. You wait till you see it in its bloom. The beauty of a rose can't be seen in its beginning. The beauty of a rose is manifested in the bloom. And that's when the beauty is revealed, the beauty of this flower in all its glory. Friend, I want to say the full expression of Jesus' beauty was veiled by his flesh. But one day, one day he will return in the full bloom beauty of his glory. Peter says it this way, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Let me say, in his sufferings, we didn't see any beauty, did we? Well, we do now, but the world didn't see it. But watch this that when his glory shall be revealed. There's a day when the full bloom glory of the rose of heaven, the rose of Sharon will be revealed. He says, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Thank God in that day. Now think about the rose's stem. The rose's stem, it's ugly. It's thorny. It doesn't seem fitting enough that such a beautiful flower will grow and rest on such an unattractive Stem. In fact, we say cut the stems off. But what a fitting picture that is. If he's the rose of Sharon, consider how that so parallels with the picture of Jesus. Consider Jesus' stem. Matthew chapter number 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Phares, and Zerah of Thamar, and Pharaoh begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram, and Aram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Rahab, Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias, and on and on. I won't continue on, but it continues on till you get to Jesus Christ. But what we are reading is the royal bloodline of Jesus Christ. This was the stem of the rose of Sharon. And let me tell you what it's filled with. Thorny sinners. There's thorns all over this stem. It's filled with liars. I thought about Abraham. Abraham told a few fibs in his lie and got his wife in trouble, got himself in a mess. It's filled with harlots like Rahab. It's filled with adulterers like David and Bathsheba. It's filled with even pagan idol, formerly pagan idol worshipers like Ruth, who was a Moabitess. On and on and we could point out how Jacob was a deceiver. And we go through this stem and we say, my goodness, this thing was filled with a lot of thorns. There's nothing attractive about the stem. Listen, thorns are a reminder, by the way, of the curse of sin. Thorns and, and thistles grow from the ground as a result of sin. And I want to say that even the stem that the rose comes from is touched by the curse. If you get pricked by the thorns, I read that if you get a hold of the wrong thorn because of the bacteria and the fungus that grows on them or resides on them, if some of that sap gets into your bloodstream, guess what? The thorns, when they prick and pierce your skin, can cause you to become sick. You can even become uh, feverish. I thought about that's what's happened to all of us. <laughs> that thorny stem that comes all the way from Adam is poisoned all of us. It's made us all sick. But thank God, Though David and Abraham and Joseph, all of them were sinners, from this ugly, thorny stem would bloom the most beautiful rose. Listen, the root may not be attractive, the stem may not be comely, but those who know Jesus Christ, they know that he is the beautiful rose of Sharon. The life of Abraham certainly wasn't beautiful. It had its moments. The life of David wasn't attractive. It had its moments. And I want to say, by the way, neither has my life been attractive. But Jesus, though made in the likeness, in the likeness of sinful man, he was perfectly holy. By the way, the rose is considered the perfect flower. And when I survey his holiness, I can't help but see the beauty of his holiness and his perfection. That's why we're invited to worship in his beauty. Psalms 29 and verse number 2, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. You know, there's some who would say, well, I don't like brother, uh, Rose's brother, Mark. I've met a few people like that. 
Well, that's okay, too. That's a picture of Jesus. You see, not everybody sees the beauty in Jesus. Not everyone sees the value of the sinless one. Not everybody cherishes the Son of God. But those of us who are saved, we can say with Peter that Jesus is precious. 1 Peter 2, 7 says, Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. Can I get a witness right there that if you're saved by the grace of God, Jesus is precious to you. He's the most precious friend. He's the precious Savior. He's the precious Redeemer. He's the precious Son of God. I'll tell you, he's the precious Shepherd. He's the precious. All that we need is found in him. He's precious to us unto you therefore which believe he is precious but not everybody likes roses <laughs> not this rose but unto them which be disobedient the stone which the builders disallowed he's the rejected stone let me talk secondly about the breaking of the rose in Solomon's day the rose of Sharon was sought after for more than simply a gift or to put in uh, a clay vessel to set upon your table or something like that. It was sought after for other reasons. It was gathered and then crushed for some various uses. Let me give them to you. This was pretty neat when I began to unpack it, and this is when the Lord began to say, you're preaching this tonight. And I said, okay. <laughs> the breaking of the rose. First of all, it was broken, it was crushed for cleansing and refreshing. These roses were crushed, and their petals were mixed with fresh water for cleansing and refreshing. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, most people walk during that time, very few road beasts. But either way, they would travel dusty roads. Those who had sandals, and not everybody had sandals, their feet would be dirty because they were exposed to the limestone on the streets or the dirt in the paths they trod. Others were barefooted, so everybody was always dirty and sweaty, it seemed. And after any length of travel under the oriental sun, a person would be soiled and bear the stench of their journey. So when they were received into a home, the owner, the master of the home, would greet the visitor and wash their feet, hands, and their face with water. Now, if this was an important guest, he would use fresh, crushed rose petal water. So when they entered the home, they were not only cleansed, but they were also refreshed by the aroma of the rose petal water. And by the way, as they entered into the home, they now bore the aroma of the rose. I began to think about how, isn't that a picture of Jesus? You and I were headed down the path of sin towards hell. I want to tell you, our lives stunk. It bore the stench of sin in our body, in our mind, in our mouth. But God thought something of us, amen. God broke out the rose, praise his holy name. In fact, he so loved us, he took the rose of Sharon, the son of God, and he allowed him to be broken for us. Jesus said, this body has been given to be broken for you. And I want to tell you, the rose of Sharon was wounded so that we could be cleansed. What a beautiful aroma was unleashed there at the cross of Calvary. It was for our cleansing and for our refreshing. Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself. He's the gift, he's the rose, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Not only was there a lamb hanging there on that cross, but there was also a rose that was being crushed whose aroma was being lifted up to heaven. Today, you and I, we no longer, if we're saved by the grace of God, we don't bear the repulsive stench of sin and death. Brother George was going out of church today, and he said, Brother Mark, I ran into a fellow. You know, he drives uh, and picks up people like a taxi service, and so he's, I don't know if it's not really Uber, it's the other service. But anyway, he, he does that kind of work, and he said, I picked up somebody you went to high school with. I said, oh, hold up a second, amen. I, I'm saved. You tell him I'm preaching him. Oh, yeah, I told him to come to your church. And, you know, I, I was just reminded, thank God as I was studying this, I no longer bear the stench of hell and death and sin. I, I don't bear the stench of that old lie, praise God, because of the rose of Sharon, because that rose was broken and those petals were crushed, because that's been applied to my life. I no longer bear that old stench. I bear the aroma of Christ Jesus, my Savior. And that's a sweet-smelling savor. You say, you sure about that? Absolutely. We don't bear the repulsive stench of sin and death today. We give off the fragrance of life, the sweet aroma of the rose of Sharon. You say, well, there's some people that are allergic and repulsed by the smell of roses. Yeah, and that's a picture of Christ's aroma in our lives too. Say Corinthians 2.15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. In them that are saved and 
in them that, are, that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. In other words, we don't smell attractive to everybody. Some people are repulsed. We're the smell of death. Well, that's okay. As long as I'm a sweet-smelling savor unto God, that's what matters. But not only was the rose gathered and then crushed for cleansing and refreshing, it was also used for medicinal reasons. This was very interesting. The rose of Sharon's flower bud contains mucilage, a gooey medicinal compound made of, and Kim will have to help me if I don't pronounce this right, it's a medicinal compound made of polysaccharides found in most species of the mallow family. I know you wanted to hear that tonight. But anyway, this mucilage, this is what's important. This mucilage can be used to heal burns, wounds, gastric ulcers, and internal and external inflammation and irritation such as sore throats or urinary tract infections. In fact, I read that people with fevers in that they would be given a cup of crushed rose petal water to help bring down the fever. This what rose was sought after for its healing properties. This flower had all kind of benefits. I began to read that. Now, that's got nothing to do on a Christian website. You just Google it, and you can read that. And I began to get excited because I said, what a picture of Jesus, the broken rose. I remember when my life was sick, and I was running a spiritual fever from the infection of sin. I have been sick from my birth, and I would have died in my sin disease condition unless God done something for me. But I heard a man of God, an old man of God, preach about a cure, a cure that flowed from a broken rose. And I heard that if I received the healing that flowed red from the wounds and the stripes of heaven's rose, I could be healed. He said it like this in Isaiah 53 and verse number 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And I want to say, when I drank from that healing flow, I want you to know I received a greater healing, a truer healing. I received a spiritual healing. I received the healing of my soul. The blood of Jesus cured my sin disease. It banished the fever of sin that raged in my life. It cured the sin problem of my soul once and for all through the sacrifice of Christ, the broken rose of Sharon. I read that this, this rose petal water also had the ability to lower blood pressure. That's interesting. What a picture of Christ. I remember as a little boy sitting on the church pew, terrified, my heart racing at the thought of dying or the Lord returning. When you're not saved, that's not a good feeling to think about the Lord coming back or leaving this world. I'll tell you, that thought caused my blood pressure to skyrocket. I didn't want to stand before God. But I want to say now, Jesus' sacrifice now that I've drunk from that healing flow, he has, he's brought the blood pressure down. Let me say it this way. He's removed the sting out of death. He's now made death not something I dread, but a doorway to gain. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Aren't we a strange breed? Those of us who have been truly impacted and healed by the rose of Sharon, we actually see death is gain. The world says, oh no, death's not gain, death's law. Death is lost. Well, for them it is. It's lost for all of eternity. But praise God, it's eternal gain for us that are saved, that have been healed by that broken rose. So when this corruptible, 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says, so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? I'll tell you, I feel my blood pressure going down. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for the broken rose. But not only that, I thought about the blooming of the rose. I was trying to find an application, but I read that dead roses cannot bloom. <laughs> I said, well, that don't work, amen. But then I was reminded this rose does bloom. This rose was laid dead in the ground for three days. And like a snow that covers up 
what seems to be dead and lifeless. And then the sun comes forth and it begins to melt and you find out that it is alive. That's exactly what happened with this rose. John 19, 38, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Here's the broken rose, dead and lifeless. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. What a wonderful place to plant a rose. There was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. Matthew says in Matthew 28, verse number 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Listen, he is the blooming rose, amen. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. I want to tell you, the beautiful rose of Sharon sprung forth from the soil of the grave, and he blooms forevermore. I read... The story of a man who went to get, he was a preacher, and he wrote this. He went to get his wife some roses. And uh, the lady at the flower shop said, be careful, keep your window down, because these are fresh picked, fresh cut roses, and we haven't had a chance to wash them. And so there's probably a lot of pollen still on them. And if you close up your windows, if you stay in that car any length of time, you're going to end up with something called rose fever. He said, lady, it's too late. I've already got it, amen. (laughs) I've already fallen in love with the rose of Sharon. I'll tell you, he has my heart thumping. He has my affections. He has my soul. He is the most precious thing to me. He is the fairest of 10,000. He's altogether lovely. Listen, I've already got rose fever, the rose of Sharon fever. Jesus is the most beautiful rose. He's the rose of Sharon and the love and the glory and the praise of my life. Is he yours? There used to be a song, and I'll close with the lyrics of it. Squire Parsons wrote it. I began to sing this. I, couldn't, I was shocked that I could remember the words, but I'll, I know they'd fail me when I get up here, so I'm going to have them printed out before me so that I can read them to you. But it says, Words cannot describe its beauty as upon the stem it grows, matchless in its glory, the tender little rose. When its petals are broken, its greatest beauty it shows, for sweeter the fragrance of the broken rose. And here's the chorus. The most beautiful rose was broken one day, nailed to a tree on a hill far away, forsaken by his friends, bruised by his foes. How sweet is the fragrance of heaven's sweet rose. Then they laid that broken rose in a borrowed tomb, but on the third day, that rose again did bloom. Now to the heights of heaven, down to the deepest hell, the fragrance of heaven's rose continually dwells. The most beautiful rose was broken one day, nailed to a tree on a hill far away, forsaken by his friends, bruised by his foes. How sweet is the fragrance of heaven's sweet rose. How blessed are we that God would give heaven's rose that he might be broken and crushed, that we might be cleansed, that we might be cleansed of the stench of sin and the aroma of death and bear a sweet-smelling savor that arises from our life and be cleansed from sin and be healed from sin 
I'll tell you, I love him tonight. And I believe the Lord just wanted me to kind of lift him up tonight. It's awful easy whenever you look in the book of Revelation to be kind of trembling and kind of want to stand away. And while we should have a balance, we should have a holy reverential fear, we must not forget about the love of God and the love of Christ. This rose was trampled at Calvary under the feet of men, under the feet of soldiers. We pierced him. We nailed him to a cross. But thank God through the crushing of that rose, God's rose, came healing. Came something greater than what would flow from a natural rose with its healing properties. There came spiritual healing properties. Thank God for the sweet rose of Sharon. I pray you never listen to a song or hear that phrase mentioned ever again without truly appreciating what it speaks of. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. As the pianist comes to the piano, picks out a